March 9, 1945, 11.47 p.m., Lieutenant Nakamura Hiroshi pushed his Nakajima Ki 84 fighter to maximum climb rate over Tokyo Bay. His radio crackled with urgent orders from ground control, 300 American B-29 Superfortress bombers approaching from the south. Altitude, 7,000 feet. Speed, 230 miles per hour. Time to intercept, 15 minutes. Hiroshi had flown 42 combat missions against American bombers. He knew the B-29's reputation. Japanese pilots called it the Invincible Fortress. But tonight, something was different. The Americans were flying low, lower than any previous raid, lower than Japanese fighters could normally reach them. For the first time in months, Hiroshi had a chance to close to firing range. He didn't know that what he was about to discover would explain why Japanese fighter squadrons were losing the air war over Japan. By March 1945, the strategic bombing campaign against Japan had reached a critical turning point. American forces controlled the Mariana Islands, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, placing Tokyo within range of the B-29 Superfortress, the most advanced bomber in the world. The B-29 represented a technological leap beyond anything Japan could match. Maximum speed, 357 miles per hour. Service ceiling, 31,850 feet. Range, 3,250 miles. Bomb load, 20,000 pounds. But the B-29's most revolutionary feature wasn't its size or range. It was its defensive armament system. Previous American bombers, the B-17 Flying Fortress and B-24 Liberator, relied on manned gun turrets. Gunners sat exposed in cramped positions, manually aiming and firing 50 caliber machine guns at attacking fighters. The system was effective, but limited. Each gunner could only cover one sector. Coordination between positions was difficult, and at high altitude, gunners suffered from cold, hypoxia, and fatigue. The B-29 changed everything. Lieutenant Hiroshi was about to find out. Lieutenant Hiroshi joined the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force in 1942, trained on the Nakajima Ki 43 Hayabusa fighter. By 1945, he had transitioned to the Ki 84 Hayate, one of Japan's most advanced fighters, capable of matching American P-51 Mustangs in speed and maneuverability. The Kai 84 was fast. Maximum speed, 392 miles per hour. Service ceiling, 34,450 feet. Armament, two 20 mm cannons and two 12.7 mm machine guns. On paper, it could intercept B-29s at any altitude. But paper specifications didn't account for reality. By March 1945, Japan's air defense system was collapsing. Fuel shortages limited training flights. Experienced pilots were dead or reassigned. Maintenance crews lacked spare parts. Many Kai 84s couldn't reach their rated performance due to poor quality fuel and worn engines. Hiroshi's squadron, the 47th Sentai, based at Narimasu Airfield northwest of Tokyo, had started the war with 36 aircraft. By March 1945, only 14 remained operational. Of those, only eight had experienced pilots. Japanese fighter tactics against B-29s had evolved through brutal trial and error. Early attempts at tail attacks proved suicidal. The B-29's tail guns could engage targets at 1,000 yards. Beam attacks from the side were ineffective. The remote turrets tracked too quickly. Head-on attacks offered the best chance, but required precise timing and nerves of steel. Hiroshi had attempted three head-on attacks in previous missions. Each time, he'd been driven off by defensive fire before reaching effective range. The B-29's guns seemed to track him before he even began his attack run. The tracers came from multiple directions simultaneously, and the volume of fire was overwhelming. But tonight was different. The Americans were flying at 7,000 feet, less than one quarter of their normal bombing altitude. At that height, Japanese fighters could maintain speed and maneuverability, and Hiroshi would have more time to line up his attack. As his Ki-84 climbed through 5,000 feet, Hiroshi checked his ammunition. 120 rounds per 20mm cannon, 350 rounds per machine gun. 
enough for two, maybe three attack passes. He didn't know he wouldn't get the chance to fire them all. At 11.58 p.m., Hiroshi spotted the first B-29s. They appeared as dark silhouettes against the lighter sky, flying in loose formation at 7,000 feet. He counted 30 bombers in the first wave, with more following behind. The formation stretched for miles. Ground control vectored him toward the lead elements. His orders were clear. Attack from the front, aim for the cockpit and engines, break away before reaching minimum separation distance. Standard head-on tactics. Hiroshi positioned his key 84 three miles ahead of the formation, climbing to 8,000 feet to give himself a slight altitude advantage. He would dive through the formation, fire a burst at the lead bomber, then pull up and away before the defensive guns could track him. It was a tactic he'd practiced dozens of times. At one mile distance, Hiroshi rolled inverted and pulled into a steep dive, accelerating to 400 miles per hour. The lead B-29 grew larger in his gun sight. He could see the bomber's nose glazing, the four massive engines, the distinctive high tail. At 800 yards, he pressed the firing button. His 20 millimeter cannons roared, sending shells toward the B-29's cockpit. Tracers arced through the night sky. Then something happened that Hiroshi had never experienced before. The B-29's defensive fire didn't come from the tail or waist positions. It came from everywhere at once. Tracers converged on his fighter from the top, bottom, and sides simultaneously. The volume of fire was three times heavier than anything he'd encountered on previous missions. Hiroshi broke left, pulling six Gs in a desperate evasive maneuver. Tracers followed him through the turn. He heard impacts, metallic clangs as .50 caliber rounds struck his aircraft's tail and left wing. His cockpit filled with the smell of cordite and hydraulic fluid. He'd been in range for less than three seconds, and in those three seconds, the B-29 had fired more rounds at him than an entire formation of B-17. As Hiroshi pulled away, climbing back to attack altitude, he realized something was fundamentally different about the B-29's defensive system. The guns had tracked him before he opened fire, they'd engaged from multiple positions simultaneously, and they'd followed him through his evasion maneuver with impossible accuracy. This wasn't normal defensive fire. This was something else. Hiroshi circled at 10,000 feet, watching other Japanese fighters attempt their attacks. Each time, the result was the same. A brief burst of cannon fire, followed by overwhelming defensive fire from multiple B-29 turrets, forcing the attacker to break away. One Kai-84 from his squadron, flown by Sergeant Tanaka, pressed his attack too close. Hiroshi watched as tracers from three different B-29 turrets converged on Tanaka's fighter. The Ki-84 exploded in midair, torn apart by concentrated .50 caliber fire. That's when Hiroshi understood. The B-29's guns weren't being aimed by individual gunners. They were being controlled by a central system that coordinated all defensive positions. When one gunner acquired a target, other turrets automatically tracked the same fighter. The system calculated lead angles and firing solutions faster than any human gunner could. This explained everything. The impossible tracking speed, the coordinated fire from multiple positions, the accuracy at long range. The B-29 wasn't defended by individual gunners. It was defended by a computer network. Japanese intelligence had reported that American bombers used remote turrets, but no one had explained what that meant in practice. Hiroshi now understood. The B-29's gunners sat inside the pressurized fuselage, operating sighting stations that controlled unmanned turrets mounted on the aircraft's exterior. They weren't exposed to the elements. They weren't limited by physical position. And they could control multiple turrets simultaneously. The system gave American gunners three critical advantages. First, visibility. Gunners used optical sights with magnification allowing them to acquire targets at longer ranges than Japanese pilots could see through their gun sights. The B-29's gunners could engage fighters at 1,000 yards, well beyond the effective range of Japanese 20mm cannons. Second, coordination. The fire control officer, typically the upper gunner, could direct all turrets to engage priority targets. If a fighter attacked from the front, 
Both forward turrets would track it automatically. If it broke away, the rear turrets would take over. There were no gaps in coverage. Third, computational accuracy. The analog computers calculated ballistic trajectories based on target range, airspeed, altitude, and angular velocity. They automatically adjusted for parallax, the difference between where the gunner sat and where the guns were mounted. They compensated for the bomber's own movement through the air, and they calculated lead angles that accounted for the time bullets needed to reach the target. A human gunner might estimate these factors. The B-29's computer calculated them with mathematical precision. Hiroshi realized that Japanese fighter tactics, developed against B-17 and B-24s, were obsolete. The head-on attack, the beam attack, the climbing tail attack, all assumed that defensive fire would come from individual gunners with limited fields of fire and manual aiming systems. Against the B-29's central fire control system, these tactics were suicide. But Hiroshi had no way to communicate this discovery to other pilots. At 12.14 a.m., the first B-29s began dropping their payloads. But these weren't high-explosive bombs. They were M-69 incendiary clusters, each containing 47 six-pound napalm bomblets designed to start fires in Tokyo's wooden buildings. The city below erupted in flames. Hiroshi could see the fires spreading from his altitude, block by block, district by district. The Americans weren't targeting military installations. They were targeting the city itself. Hiroshi pushed his Kai-84 into a steep dive, approaching the B-29 formation from below and behind, a blind spot where the lower rear turret had limited traverse. He would climb rapidly, fire a burst into the bomber's belly, then dive away before the turrets could track him. It was a desperate tactic, but it was the only approach that might work. At 500 feet below the formation, Hiroshi pulled back on the stick, climbing at maximum power. His Ki-84 accelerated upward, closing the distance to the nearest B-29. He could see the bomber's bomb bay doors, still open after releasing its incendiary load. At 300 yards, he opened fire. His 20mm cannons sent shells into the B-29's fuselage. He saw impacts, flashes of light as armor-piercing rounds struck metal. Then, the B-29's lower rear turret rotated toward him. Hiroshi saw the muzzle flashes before he heard the impacts. Fifty caliber rounds tore through his left wing, shredding the aileron and puncturing the fuel tank. His cockpit filled with the smell of aviation gasoline. He broke right, rolling inverted and diving away from the formation. His engine sputtered, fuel pressure dropping. His left wing was trailing smoke, and his hydraulic system was failing. Hiroshi had been in range for less than two seconds, and in those two seconds, the B-29's defensive system had crippled his fighter. As he descended toward Narimasu airfield, struggling to keep his damaged Ki-84 airborne, Hiroshi understood the terrible truth. Japanese fighters couldn't defeat the B-29, not with current tactics, not with current technology and not with the training and resources available in March 1945. The B-29 wasn't just a better bomber. It was a technological leap that Japanese aviation couldn't match. Hiroshi managed to land his crippled Ki-84 at Narimasu airfield at 1.47 a.m. His left wing was shredded, his fuel tank nearly empty, and his hydraulic system completely failed. Ground crews counted 37 bullet holes in the aircraft's fuselage and wings. He was one of the lucky ones. Of the eight key 84s from his squadron that engaged the B-29 formation that night, only three returned to base. Sergeant Tanaka's fighter had exploded in mid-air. Lieutenant Yamamoto crashed on approach, his aircraft too damaged to control. Sergeant Ito bailed out over Tokyo Bay and was never recovered. Two other pilots were listed as missing last seen pursuing B-29s toward the coast. The 47th Sentai had lost five fighters and five pilots in less than 90 minutes, and they had shot down zero B-29s. The raid itself was catastrophically effective. 334 B-29s dropped 1,665 tons of incendiary bombs on Tokyo. The resulting firestorm killed an estimated 100,000 civilians and destroyed 16 square miles of the city.
an area larger than the combined destruction of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki four months later. Japanese air defenses shot down 14 B-29s, a loss rate of 4%. But Japanese fighter squadrons lost 126 aircraft, a 9 to 1 kill ratio in favor of the Americans. The numbers told the story. The B-29's central fire control system had fundamentally changed the balance of air combat. Japanese fighters, designed to engage manned bombers with limited defensive fire, couldn't survive against computer-directed turrets that tracked multiple targets simultaneously. In the weeks following the March 9th raid, Japanese air commanders attempted to develop new tactics. They tried night attacks, hoping darkness would reduce the effectiveness of the B-29's optical sights. They tried massed formations, hoping to overwhelm the defensive system with multiple simultaneous attacks. They even tried ramming attacks, kamikaze tactics adapted for air-to-air -air combat. Nothing worked. The B-29's fire control system was simply too advanced. By August 1945, American B-29s had dropped 160,000 tons of incendiary and high-explosive bombs on Japanese cities, flying with near impunity despite desperate Japanese fighter resistance. The strategic bombing campaign destroyed 67 cities and killed an estimated 300,000 civilians. Lieutenant Hiroshi survived the war, but his squadron didn't. The B-29's central fire control system represented one of World War II's most significant technological innovations. Developed by General Electric between 1940 and 1943, the system combined analog computers, remote-controlled turrets, and coordinated fire control into an integrated defensive network. The technology wasn't perfect. The analog computers sometimes malfunctioned at high altitude, the remote turrets occasionally jammed, and the system required extensive maintenance. B-29 crews spent hours between missions calibrating sites and testing fire control circuits. But even with these limitations, the system gave American bombers a decisive advantage over Japanese fighters. The central fire control system influenced post-war aviation development in profound ways. Modern military aircraft, from bombers to fighters to attack helicopters, use computer-assisted targeting systems descended from the B-29's analog fire control computers. The concept of remote weapon stations, now standard on unmanned aerial vehicles, originated with the B-29's remote turrets. The system also demonstrated a fundamental principle of military technology. Integration matters more than individual components. The B-29's .50 caliber machine guns weren't more powerful than Japanese 20mm cannons. But when integrated into a computer-controlled network, they became far more effective than manually aimed weapons. Japanese aviation engineers understood this principle. But by 1945, Japan lacked the industrial capacity, resources, and time to develop equivalent systems. The technological gap between American and Japanese aviation had become unbridgeable. Lieutenant Hiroshi's discovery on March 9, 1945, that the B-29's defensive system was computer-controlled and impossible to defeat with conventional tactics, came too late to change the outcome of the air war over Japan. But his experience illustrated a larger truth about World War II. The conflict was decided not just by courage and tactics, but by technology and industrial capacity. The B-29 Superfortress, with its revolutionary central fire control system, represented American technological superiority in its most devastating form. And Japanese pilots like Lieutenant Hiroshi paid the price for that technological gap with their lives. This is Tales of Valor podcast. We explore World War II beyond the battlefield, revealing how technology, intelligence, and innovation shaped the war's outcome.